This will be the last session, or last talk of this session. So please uh, give your attention to Karina Zona, who will be talking about schemas for the real world. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Um, as you heard, my name is Karina Cizona. Uh, you can find me all over the internet as C. Cizona. Uh, my slides aren't up. How do we get those up? Okay, there's mine. Okay, it looked too much like yours. Okay. Um, so I wear several hats. First of all, I'm a community manager. I'm a developer, and I'm also a certified sex educator. I used to work for an organization called San Francisco Sex Information, otherwise known as SFISI, and it took me about a year to learn how to pronounce that. Um, SFISI has a really simple mandate to answer any question as long as we can do so accurately, confidentially, and without judgment. And as you can guess, when people are given the opportunity to ask literally anything, um, they do. And you'd expect that to be some pretty far-flung questions, but the reality is that they actually tend to boil down to something really simple. Am I okay? Do I belong? Are there people like me? And that sense of people not being sure that their identity is okay and valid was really surprising to me. And, you know, here I am, this person who's both a developer and a sex educator, and I think most people see those things as really far apart, but I don't. I see connections all the time. And, you know, Maybe sometimes, if you think about it, you will too. Imagine walking through the world knowing that everyone's first assumptions about how you see yourself, who you love, and what feels right for you are completely wrong. Now imagine signing up for a cool website and then being required to select an option from a drop-down menu that doesn't include anything that represents you. You'll feel defeated. You'll want to argue that whatever they think they're learning from that drop-down menu, it's not really true. You'll want to tell them that they're adding to your humiliation by making you do this. You'll want to tell them that they're missing a huge part of you. Users are giving pushback to assumptions that leave them out. Social apps in particular are being pressed to adjust. Facebook, Google, others have been dealing with these questions for years, and they're still working it out, releasing changes all the time in their attempts to get this stuff right even this month, even this week. It's constant. So if you feel out of depth along the way, just know that you're not the only one at all. All right, slide. Show up. What's going on here? OK, we have to wait for the whole timer to go through again. This will be fun. All right, so we're going to talk about normalization. Um, so usually when you hear the word normalization, you're thinking about data normalization, right? Um, but normalization is also a social sciences construct. Um, it is the uh, idea that we can, um, what are norms? What, what is essentially normal? What do we see as how things are? Um, there we go, okay. Um, and so we've got this sort of computer science version of what normalization is, and then we've got this social science version of what normalization is. Um, and when we talk about social sciences, I'm dealing with things like anthropology, psychology, sociology, anything that's dealing with who humans are. So when we're collecting data on people, we're in that different realm of the social sciences. And so we have to be able to extract conclusions about people. If we want to do that, then we have to learn social sciences methods of study in the first place. And that means that there's two types of uh, criteria that we have to meet for data collection. At minimum, field values need to be exhaustive. That means that they need to offer as options every single value in the universe for that. Here's an example. All right, hair colors. This looks pretty exhaustive. On the other hand, yellow's missing. I mean, if we're going to put in artificial hair colors, yellow's one of them, right? All right, so now are we completely covering all the bases? We got all the Roy G. Biv in there, right? OK, well, people can have more than one hair color. That somehow has to be included, too, because this is a select, right? Like, you only get one option. So there's going to have to be an option here for multicolored. So we still have problems. This isn't really exhaustive. 
particularly if you're trying to be informative, if the whole point was to find out what color, does multicolor really give us that information? So field names all, or field values also need to be mutually exclusive. That means there's absolutely no overlap whatsoever between them. Um, and if you really think about how many social apps have both of those bare minimum criteria covered in all the questions that they ask of us, or even any. So here's an example. You know, we look at this and we think, that seems to be exhaustive and mutually exclusive description of the various headings for sexual orientation. Um, you know, we've seen this one fairly often, it even has bisexual, right? So it's finding a way to cover all the various options. Um, but, you know, that's just one possible way of, of uh, thinking about this. Another way to conceptualize it is called the Kinsey scale. Uh, so this has uh, values ranging from exclusively heterosexual to exclusively homosexual. Uh, but this one also is, is really not sufficient. So let's look at some other ways that we can model this. All right, so now, you know, we have more of a gradation going on, right? There's a little more option for subtlety, and we've added this key feature of none of your business, which technically isn't a sexual orientation, eh, although you could find someone who'd say it is. Um, but it's, it's also part of that universe, right, of trying to find all the possible values. But that's lacking too, because there are a lot of other ways to think about sexual orientation. We've really moved beyond this idea that gay and straight and bisexual somewhere in the middle are really enough to cover all the possibilities. Um, in fact, even these really don't cover all the possibilities because the possibilities keep on growing. Um, but each of these is a different mental model of what does normal look like? What are all the possible values in the world? Um, and they're all still inadequate to express that real world complexity. So, we realize that the world has great variety. Of course we understand that. It's just that it's hard to figure out how to model it. So sociological normalization is that construction of social norms. Conflating two different kinds of normalization works out just fine if you only want users who are among the select few people who belong to the idealized norm, right? Most of us would like to have more than two or three users. So that's not really gonna work. Uh, what we lose track of is one of the core tenets of database normalization, that we're supposed to mirror real-world concepts and their interrelationships. That's the basic definition of doing normalization. So when the database is in tension with people's own real world, then it's not the people who need to be adjusting. We're the ones who need to adjust. So why is it hard for us to do that? At first glance, you know, I think we just look at stuff like forms and we think that's easy. We do forms all the time. We fill them out, we make them. This is just, this is part of the air we breathe. There's nothing surprising in forms. But we get up by some flawed, we get tripped up by flawed premises. And the first one is the premise that deeply personal stuff about humans can be reduced to lists. I love XKCD. There's an XKCD for everything. Um, and second, there's assumptions that canonical lists for everything can exist, or that if it doesn't yet, then surely we can just make one. <laughs> yes. I forget how many this is, it's around 200. Um, this is from an actual website. This was, I believe, British Airways, if I recall correctly. Um, they no longer do this. And my favorite part is look at the ones at the bottom. <laughs> uh, yeah, they realized that in all of their attempts to, to, you know, do the exhaustive part of this, that most people at the end of the day were going to have just a few values that they were interested in. Okay, so exhaustive, potentially covered. I, I suspect that there's still lots that aren't. But is it... Mutually exclusive. This is a select list. It doesn't look to me like a multi-select. Um, I can be a Mrs. and a doctor. You've already failed. So it's really easy to wind up looking foolish, and we haven't even solved the problem that we set out to solve. So you think about what is a social network? What is it in just purely human terms, regardless of whether there's any apps, technology at all involved? Social involves trust. It's individuals revealing who they are, what they value, who they care about. That's as personal as we can get, right? This is the real life that our apps are meant to replicate and to build upon. 
So we have to ask ourselves, what relationships are we fostering between the person and our app? And the flip side of that is, what are we accidentally denying? In real life, saying, I know your personhood better than you sounds presumptuous. But we do that. In real life, saying your existence is not possible sounds clueless at best. We do that too. In real life, saying who you are is invalid is so arrogant. And yet we're fine with doing that. Data modeling is psychology, but it is also philosophy. It reflects individual beliefs about reality rather than reflecting reality itself. It rejects reality's complexity and richness, and that's not what we're setting out to do. It's definitely not the community we set out to build. I love this quote so much. I think I only truly understand how complex the real world is when I try to model it in a database. Postel's law reminds us to be conservative in what we do and be liberal in what we accept. Are we doing that? So how do we get there? We need to start by asking ourselves, what benefit will the user notice? And we have to be really careful because this is not equivalent to how will the user benefit? Because that latter version, it grants us a lot of latitude to assume that what we want is, of course, what's going to benefit them. We're going to be able to give them benefit of all these cool features, right? Okay, so we need to be able to focus on their experiences, not on what we offer, what our features are, but what they get out of the experience, what they can extract for themselves. And it's easy to kind of figure like, eh, we can just refactor this stuff later, you know, this is good, but down the road. Um, the thing is that initial choices are what set differing user experiences in motion right from the start. So thinking at the outset about the real world's variety and complexity is going to start us off asking really early questions that set the foundation for social app building at all. So we want to come back to asking that question again. What user experience does this schema drive us toward? Storage is cheap. UX is what's expensive. If you need to parse what a person gave you, store the original value alongside it. Use the database schema itself to embed institutional memory of every field's assumptions. We think we're storing a value, but there's some sort of assumption inherent in that as well. Let's be explicit with ourselves and for everyone else who is developing using this as to what it was we actually collected. <laughs> Someone has a story later. Um, ask the real question. We ask so many questions by rote, but some of them are proxies for what we really are seeking. And we're roughly mashing up these disparate data points to roughly intuit what we could be simply asking very directly for. So what's the real question? Yeah. All right. So. What is the real question behind this? Um, could it be, were you born before 1991? Um, I'm not sure what would be driving that question. So right away, we still haven't reached the real question. What, do you, what are you trying to figure out with that? Maybe the question is, are you over 25? But that also tells us that there's some reason why you need to know that this person is over 25 or what year they were born. What is it you're trying to get at? Asking the real question allows us to be least nosy, least annoying, most specific. And there really isn't only just one way to deal with all this stuff. There's no one right answer. That's not what I can give you today. But because the nature of a dilemma is because users vary, and so do their social worlds. Evaluating user perspective is what gives us focus. We always need to understand varying approaches, how to model for different contexts, what trade-offs each of them brings on, and what's the obvious, everyday, pragmatic question, which approaches best serve this app's business requirements. This is not about idealism. This is about how do we service the product, the intentions, the outcomes we're seeking. Checkboxes, radio buttons, select menus, ranges. 
These each imply that every possible value can and is included, that the criteria for exhaustive and exclusive both have been met. If any value is not included there, its real world is being rejected because it didn't match up with our mental schema. So checking a box has real big appeal. It's a one-step action, right? Entering a text string is not. So, you know, anytime you get into a sort of free-form text solution, such as a text area or a text input, it's not automatically exciting. It also has some accessibility issues. Um, so I want to be candid about that. On the other side, um, there can be visible, meaningful benefit. So let's look at just one concrete example here. At Metafilter, gender, for instance, has been a text field for over a decade. Initially, some shuddered at the thought because the early crowd at Metafilter was often programmers, and they hated the idea of dirty data collection. They were upset for about five seconds. Then they jumped on board because they could be creative and silly. This is where people tweet about dangly bits. Um, and because they could also express this thing about themselves fully with authentic voice, that text field grew into a beloved institution. Whatever you as a user chose to put in that field says something revealing about who you are that you're allowed to put in anything or put in nothing at all, says something revealing about how Metafilter envisions community. That schema's trust in users was the foundation for Metafilter users to ask, can we please share more about ourselves? Will you let us do that here? How many other social apps have that kind of relationship with the users? So here's a counterexample. 2010, Diaspora was also turning gender into a text field. And just like on Metafilter almost a decade earlier, users felt really set free by that. But there's a really important distinction in this. Metafilter is closed source. It was for a long time run by just one developer. And it's entirely in English. Whereas Diaspora had a really different set of needs. It's open source, huge community of developers, and it's international. So some of its developers were not amused at all. It's fair to say that this approach really will wreak chaos on internationalization of pronouns. You don't have something to jump off of. And here's what I can say about that. So what? Internationalization of pronouns is hellish, period. We get no safety net. Constraining options does not solve translation of languages. Don't set yourself up for trying to protect against internationalization hell this way. It will fail you. If you really think that boiling this question down to what's your legal gender is going to be the way you kind of escape this problem, let's talk about internationalization of that too. Indeterminate is legal gender on German birth certificates. Blank is also legal in Germany. X is legal in Australia and in New Zealand. Sex not specified is another that's legal in Australia. In some parts of the UK, MX is a legal gender. How are we going to internationalize that? Randall Munro, best known as the voice of, you guessed it, XKCD, has examined the issue of pronouns many times in depth just for English language projects alone. And he says, it's the most complicated thing I've ever spent a lot of time learning about. And I've spent a lot of time learning about quantum mechanics. He's not kidding, by the way. Um, so here's what he ultimately concluded. Ask. It's the only thing you can do. Ask. Ask straight up, which pronouns do you prefer? It's truly the best way that he could come up with. So, you know, I think it's typical to kind of say like, okay, so options are women, men, so pronouns are he, she, we got this covered, right? No, it's kind of the whole point. If we could boil this down to just, you know, male, female, we could all go home. Um, so we have other options. So here is just in terms of the English language are various options. And I really want to point out this final one that really seems to somehow get overlooked. 
Pronouns stand in for nouns, right? We can just use the noun. You could say just as easily, Karina updated her, you know, her feed as she updated her feed. It's okay. Um, but maybe one slightly refine the list, kind of like this, right? Um, and by now, I think you're probably looking at that third row and getting just a little bit itchy. Some part of your mind maybe protesting. Our English teachers told us that they, they're, that they're only singular, right? Nope. They're plural and they're singular, and they have been for 400 years. You can take the word of Jane Austen, Shakespeare, Chaucer, King James Bible. Modern English authorities all agree on this one, too. It's excellent English, and I think from our perspective, it's excellent social skills to be using this when people ask us to. Even Facebook has taken note that it's okay, and I'll tell you, they've done some interesting back and forth on this over the years. Um, it used to be that you had to do a little bit of hacking uh, of uh, form in order to get the, the neutral pronoun. Um, more recently, they've actually made this an explicit option, um, but this particular possibility was available for at least six years, uh, and they've been doing fine. Um, interesting enough, in 2008, they actually had a lovely blog post saying that this was impossible. <laughs> Um, so this is the more recent version of how they've been dealing with, with gender. Um, it used to be that you just had male, female. There's now a third option of custom. Uh, and then when you do that, you get much more uh, possibilities on the form. Um, and one of them being those pronouns, right? So you can choose from three possible sets of pronouns. And you also get this interesting new field um, that allows you to select other values. They launched with, I believe it was 56 additional gender values. And what's interesting about custom is it's not just freeing you from the labels, well, some freedom. Um, it also lets you have more than one. So this is an interesting way of hybridizing solutions. And think about what the various implications of each of these choices are. Um, let's look at something else, names. A name isn't just what we call someone. It's rife with history, family ties, identity, relationships, choices. It's personally meaningful. We are too eager to impose validations, transformations, clever parsing. Maybe this looks like someone forgot to just use the shift key but lowercase was very deliberately chosen, and it is the correct form of her legal name. Mononyms, that's a full name of one word total, are totally a thing, legally. I have even met this guy. He was really excited that someone was actually talking about mononyms. Um, there's actually a few people that you know who have mononyms. Teller of Penn and Teller, right? That is his legal name, Teller. And you know, uh, as a developer, Hi, rich person, please feel free to walk in and give me money. Please feel free to use your vast audience and fan base to like, make recommendations of my app to them. Why would we want to meet anyone at the door and say, you know, go away, I don't like your name, so please do not participate in my app. And yet we accidentally do this stuff all the time. We can never anticipate the emotional impact of trying to just be helpful. So be very wary of trying to fix a name. Every person is the authority on their own name. No matter how unlikely it seems, someone, somewhere, has a name more bizarre than you could possibly imagine. That is legal. Uh, and my favorite part is if you look really closely, apparently he's first name Kentucky, last name friedchicken.com. Uh, that's not actually what it says in the legal documents, but this is, uh, as you can see, a bit of a, a flawed database. <laughs> um, it's an interesting uh, uh, little hack that they did. There's various ways you can approach that, actually. Um, some common ones for people with mononyms are to have, um, in, in the blank field, NFM, no first name, NFN, uh, or NLN, no last name. Um, of course, then inevitably you start getting mail for that person. <laughs> so that doesn't work so well either. 
The whole construct of first and last name is so confused about the real world's cultural variety. So first of all, in China, family name goes first. So, you know, first name, last name, what are we trying to get at? Um, and if you're thinking that if we just switch to given name and surname, then, then we've covered all the bases, that's not true either. Surprise! In many cultures, there isn't really a notion of a family name. So for instance, um, we have the former Secretary General of the United Nations, and we have uh, one of the most famous human rights barristers in the world, um, and they both come from cultures in which you have a given name, and it is preceded by an abbreviation of your father's given name. So oftentimes, even the part of the custom will be uh, initialisms for several of, of your previous male um, predecessors. I'm trying to remember the name here. So, you know, dad, grandpa, et cetera. Um, but there isn't something here that if you gave them surname as a field, what are they supposed to do with that? So they're constantly having to make decisions that don't really reflect what we think we're asking. Bjork is not just her stage name. Icelanders also have a very similar custom. Um, they have a given name, and then for disambiguation purposes, uh, it's followed by essentially the given name of their father. Um, so I'm trying to remember what hers is, something like Björk Dortsmunder or something. Uh, but essentially, it's referring to her father. Um, but this is, for all intents and purposes, essentially another mononym. So here's Google Contacts. <clears throat> Name is a single open text field until it isn't. Go back and it has been changed. It's been quietly parsed and it has applied rules that are really narrowly culturally bound and that mess with people who don't fit with those assumptions. And this leads us to a much more loaded area because parsing someone's name into pieces has some serious ethnocentric biases to be aware of. This is not someone being difficult. This is not someone being overly formal. It's his name, every part of it. Moreover, it's really dense communication of his heritage. It's an ordered list of generations of both maternal and paternal surnames. At least 450 million people of Spanish or Portuguese descent have a name that's constructed relatively similar to this but it gets better because every one of those countries has unique tradition for how to construct those. So parsing is insane. If you want to set out to parse those names instead of trusting users for that, you're going to have to get ready for some seriously gnarly conditionals. And on top of that, you're also going to need to ask more questions in order to be able to do anything with that because now you're going to need to know birthplace and cultural heritage. Have fun. Um, Google, I'm sorry. That is none of that middle name. This is epic fail. So what do we do? We have to start by getting schemas into alignment. And yes, I did say schemas plural, because there are two different kinds. There's mental schema. These are preconceived ideas. They are a framework for representing some sort of aspect of our world. And they're a system for organizing and perceiving new information. Database schema are actually really closely related to that. Essentially, it's a mental schema translated into database blueprints. These are simply some front-end manifestations of various individuals' mental schemas. And when we look at them really closely, we can see schemas are foundation for expressing deeply intimate things, like important relationships, self-image, Schemas define user experience. Our schemas, and thus our UX, are leaving people behind. But we can fix that. We need to ask, why do we need to know this? Every time we're trying to ask a question, we should stop and ask, why? We're so used to forms that just have this series of questions that we just repeat them. We okay, need to really drill down with that. If your question is, um, well, I need to know your, your birthday for record keeping purposes. Okay, that's pretty vague. So ask why on that too. Really just keep looping down, down, down until you finally just hit a wall. So for instance, it may turn out that in fact, you did not need to know birth date. You just needed to know something really simple like we've got a compliance issue. We just need to make sure no one under 13 is getting in. 
or rather that you know, someone over 13 can be let in. So this then becomes a really easy question. They're gonna be th over 13 next year too. We didn't have to ask anything intrusive of them at all. Religion, a totally simple topic. ERIS is the largest ongoing survey of Americans' religious identification, and it just asks this one really simple, open-ended question, what is your religion, if any? And that nets over 100 unique answers, which if you're making a list based on that is tricky. Remember the titles. There's no form element that's gonna make it easy for our users to pick themselves out of a list that has just that many possibilities. Eris found, though, that they could compress that down to about 19, 13 major categories. And that's a more manageable list, right? Um, we could use that for a form, probably. But the thing is, if you look really closely at those numbers, some of them are kind of edge cases, so we'd rather focus on the genuinely major groupings. Which brings us down to this, actually. At least a quarter of Americans are some form of Christian denomination, so we're kind of done here. Every other religion would just be clutter. Those are edge cases too. And then there's really kind of crummy data sitting with it. We'd probably call you know, one or more of those essentially null categories, right? So we could fix that too, which focuses attention on a problem here. One in five are not useful answers from an advertiser's perspective, right? Or for our own analytics, which are usually the two big reasons that we like to gather this stuff. So the nullish values, it's time for them to go. So what we're left with here is a good, clear list. It covers all the big stuff. When you get reductive enough for Americans, religion is in fact a binary, which from a storage standpoint is fantastic because now we're down to a Boolean score. We would not do this. Yes, it covers the biggest categories, which totally leaves people out on something that is so important to them. On both sides of this reductionism, there are people being made really angry and alienated by this. People aren't edge cases, ever. They push back on apps that treat them that way. Here's a really neat thing. Data doesn't have to be for analysis. It's easy to get in the habit of structuring data for easy analysis. It's the first thing we think of. It's often the only thing we think of. But we can choose to look at human data from a really different perspective, to step back and wallow in the user's perspective on the data about themselves. Data can be sheer expressiveness. Data has character, individualism, distinctiveness. As developers, we have such a vision of what a good code base should be, should not be, and in the most sensible of ways, we often are arriving at solutions that are factually truthy, but they're far removed from real life utility. False premises that keep delivering us data that is helpless to do anything but reinforce, reinforce those false premises in the first place. Some people will lie if that's what it takes to get past our barriers. Antagonize a user, the user will Act. The real world is a moving target. Individuals vary, and we're constantly changing. Cultures vary, and they're changing too. So even when we've got a really good model, our data collection is still quietly diverging from reality all the time, which means every day we're collecting data that is growing more and more wrong. But on the bright side, it's tidy. <laughs> we put so much pointless work into catching exceptions, doing field validations, string transformations. We're doing a ton of extra work that doesn't net us genuine data and has no obvious value in the user's eyes. So here's my recommendation. Be lazy. Go home early. Everyone's going to be happier. As engineers, it's instinctually uncomfortable to deliberately not structure data for analysis. And I feel that tension too every time. I like columns so much. 
again, the fundamental question is, what benefit will the user notice? What identities are okay with us? If necessary, we can strike a middle ground between these different kinds of inputs. This is where a guided response comes in. In other words, auto-suggest. We can have a long list of values and guide gently towards them, but by willing, be willing to let go as soon as they want to choose something else. When there's a subset of values that you're most interested in, this is a really good approach. Auto suggest using just a handful of values you care about, rather than trying to be like, for instance, LinkedIn was, trying to have everything. Um, structured data from those who want to give it, free form to excite expressiveness in those who want to do that instead. So, unguided text. Of people who use metafilters, gendered field, 40% of responses are essentially giving the values that we think are most likely to crop up, right? So structured data is, in fact, there. This can be a really balanced solution in many cases where you're willing to tolerate some amount of ambiguity. Of course, there's always trade-offs. Data quantity is now lower, right? Free to opt out of proving personal info, many people are going to do that. On the other hand, data quality is improving. Really, no one feels like they have to lie to get through. If they're telling you this, you can be pretty confident that that's how they see themselves every day. And it's fine to mix and match approaches. You can find the right approach for your users, your app's business objectives. Facebook, for instance, makes relationship status optional. But then once you opt in, they get really coercive um, about setting a value. So even with that, most opt most users do opt in, and about 60% of them select some kind of relationship status. So we can trust. We can trust. The bottom line is that we want everyone to feel excited about what we build. We want users to feel passionate about their involvement with what we build. Analytics, investments, monetization, they're all based on a premise that data is accurate. But when data has been collected via coercive approaches, conclusions drawn from bad data are just as misdirecting decision making. The restrictive options, all that stuff at the bottom left, those don't actually have to be marked required. The way we set up schema often embeds assumptions that we should, and so we will, and so we do. An attribute that is ambiguously named is destined to become a form field whose data wanders away from its original intent. Code that misunderstands how to use what's collected. A field that's not allowed to be null is destined to become mandatory at the front end. A field that's assigned a maximum length is an assertion that all possible values are already knowable and will fit within it. Making this explicit is a communication to the team and to your future self. It's a statement of intent. It's documentation of a product decision. This is foundation for a whole different user experience. And the really cool ninja move was that we decided to do less. So we can make this stuff flexible up front, optimize storage later, decide what's valid later, if at all. What would a canonical set of relationship statuses look like? As recently as four years ago, Facebook figured that this list covered all the major use cases. Users disagreed, strongly. Under pressure, Facebook doubled the options in just two years' time. Wow, what a lot of ones they missed. Google Plus largely adopted the same list. They, for some reason, did not include separated and divorced. Not sure why. Um, as developers, how do we figure which statuses are the universal ones and which aren't? Do our mental schemas map to what the real world is with that? When you look closely, is this list even universally applicable across the US, let alone from an international perspective? What is the truth of data that doesn't fit? Google Plus also made this interesting addition of choice, permission to opt out of labeling altogether. Nearly three years later, Facebook finally opted in to letting people opt out as well.
There's always one more to add. Oops, sorry. Um, so allowing people to identify their relationships with values of greater personal significance, this is what drives people to accept a user experience. Google's mental schema communicates something really explicitly. I don't want to tell you. That's a string value, whereas Facebook's mental schema implies a null in what should be passed in. So naming a thing is creating a scope. The assumed validity of a field's values get constrained as soon as the field itself is named. Its paradigms, its possibilities, they've all been set. These are important differences in what is capable of being measured. Naming fields with great specificity up front makes analysis more powerful later. Relationship status, that's one way of looking at it. What's another? Singleness status. Singleness rating. These are all different ways of thinking about it. Marital status. All right, so if everything is related to marital status, a bunch of these actually go. You either are married, aren't married, preparing to be married, used to be married. Legal marital status. Okay, well, maybe we can add a few more here. We go through life experiencing many relationships, and they don't all have predetermined labels. They don't all have neatness. New relationship identities don't necessarily leave old ones behind. Why should anyone have to feel like they're required to disavow a relationship that's meaningful for them? That cuts so deeply sometimes. Is a widow only widowed until she resumes dating? Why does she have to be confronted with a decision like that just to use our stupid app? Hey, let's look at a different one. What, when we don't give people means to express what's real and important for them, they just go ahead and hack around this. It might take a little minute to figure out what the hack is here. 13-year-olds, one in four of them is married. Or they have a best friend. And at 13 years old, the most significant relationship in your life is your best friend. And since you weren't given an option in relationship status to use that label, you find the closest analogy. The dogged pursuit of nice, clean, crunchable data gives us such wrong places to go to. And it makes our users want to work against a system that doesn't acknowledge them. Our desire for tidy data makes it too easy to get caught up in genealogical ties we end up reducing ourselves to pedigree charts, bonds of blood or marriage, and you know, it winds up being something that we're essentially endorsing, which relationships are real, which aren't. So Ancestry.com is on the left, Facebook's on the right. With, even with that longer list, really Facebook's just trying to gender things. They actually have a shorter list when you look really closely. Half sibling is missing. I mean, you know, for a pedigree chart, Facebook has already failed. We need to be more open to how people lay claim to important family relationships that will never show up on a pedigree chart. Spot the flaw. I like the golf clap. Um, all right, uh, could somebody please stand up and yell nice and loud what the flaw is here? Only one option, you say. Yes, an open relationship is definitionally a one to marry. Many, sorry, to marry. To men, yeah! I lose. Um, yeah, it's a one to many, right? And I'm talking the CS sense of it the, has the potential for zero, one, or many relationship partners, right? Okay, so this is classic one to many. And here's, here's Facebook just not getting it at all. Say again? Yes, yes. That is, that is indeed another issue. And that's an issue actually with almost everything. Let's talk about that at Q&A, because I'm actually running over already, so I'm going to try to nail some stuff here. All right, so um, if this is a one to many, oh, geez, you guys caught me. OK. Uh, this is not at all funny, though, really, from a, a personal perspective, because this schema is really forcing the person to either look evasive or be inauthentic. So they're really being caught in a dilemma. 
This is what happens when we try to throw more labels at a problem instead of examining the schema's basic assumptions. This is really intriguing to me, the notion that has one is a code smell, that one to one is a code smell. One to many is about a potential for more than one. It's not a guarantee that there will always be many, it just makes space for the possibility. Think carefully about social attributes, relationships, identity. How many of those can you think of that are unquestionably one to one only? We can gain flexibility by baking a one to many into the schema from the beginning. Modeling the real world is complex. That's okay. Assuming we know who users are surrenders opportunity to learn who we are. Early constraints in the schema net crappy misleading data. Step back for a while. Data quality improves when lies are merely optional, not required. Data becomes like the real world itself, rich and specific. So we can unearth the patterns that are undetectable when data is merely generic. We get to make discoveries and re-envision possibilities. We adapt quickly. And their response to all this is engagement, passion, loyalty. Imagination is more important than knowledge, for knowledge is limited, whereas imagination embraces the entire world. People reveal themselves in their colorful individuality. We want them to trust us with their most personal sides. So our schemas have to be able to accept people's real world, regardless of whether we imagine it possible. Thank you. So according to my time thing, I've already run grossly over, so I apologize to you and thank you for being so tolerant of that. I love Q&A and if you want to either stick around um, or if you want to tweet me later to get together, I love having these conversations and you're certainly welcome to find me through whatever means so that we can continue that. Thanks. Okay, thank you. This ends this session. <laughs>